Hello, and welcome to week one, day one, of Da Vinci Tree's online learning. My name is Matt Roll, and I'm here with uh, Miss Kaufman over here. Hello, good morning. And uh, we are here every morning, as we normally would be at school, to do the pledge and joke. But before we begin with the pledge and joke, as always, we want to begin with uh, our announcements. And so our announcement for the morning is discussing the recent first place win at the SARSEF uh, Science Fair for our kindergarten class. Let's give them a round of applause. All right. All right. So, Ms. Kaufman, can you uh, tell us a little bit about your experiment that won first place at the SARSEF Science Fair? Thank you, Mr. Roll, uh, for mentioning our science project. They worked very hard on it. And uh, we did a science project on wondering if uh, you could taste food the same with smell as without smell. And so we found out that it is definitely easier to decipher what food is with smell by our graph and things like that. So we entered it in the SARSEF and we won first place. Congratulations. Um, Thank you so much, Ms. Kaufman, and again, a big congratulations to all of our kindergartners for winning first prize at the SARSEF Science Fair. That was just fantastic. As you may have noticed, Ms. Kaufman and myself are not standing right next to each other as we normally would. On our videos, we're going to be practicing something called social distancing. So kids, now that there is this virus going around, the COVID-19 virus, you want to make sure that if you are standing next to somebody in public, you are staying about five or six feet away from them. That social distancing will help keep you safe uh, from getting sick. And so as you watch our videos throughout the days here, you will notice that we are all practicing social distancing. Well, at this time, as always, it's time for us to get our joke of the day. And Ms. Kaufman is going to be telling us our joke of the day today. So back to you, Ms. Kaufman. For the joke of the day, it is, how do you know that hot is faster than cold? How do you know? Because you can catch a cold. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if you're with us today, I want you to stand up, put your right hand on your heart, and face a flag if you have one. Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I guess we're beginning, ready to begin our class. Welcome and congratulations. You have made it to week one, day one of Mrs. Lee's online workshop. So, what's the learning objective today? Let's take a look at the board. Our agenda. First of all, welcome. We covered that. Next is vocabulary. After that, I'm going to do a read aloud. We have our fifth and final short story from Leaf Magic today. After that, we'll go to writing, then grammar, and finally, Math. Awesome. Let's get started. For spelling and vocab, what I'd like for you to do is go ahead and write it out in both print and cursive. Let's go over today's list. First, wolf. Second, wolves. Loaf, loaves, library, libraries, child, and children. Well, we're always looking for patterns, aren't we kids? I bet you can see one here if you look closely enough. So, we actually have a lot of repeat words. Do you see that? Let's look again. Wolf and wolves. Wolf is singular, wolves is plural. So, in fact, it's actually the same word, just one word, but wolves is a variation of the word wolf. We say it when we're referring to more than one wolf, okay? So again, what is the pattern? The pattern is that we have sets 
of both singular, one, and plural, more than one, words. Awesome. So, for your assignment, I'd like for you to go ahead and write out each word, first in print, then in cursive. Do it three times each. And as always, I want to see your best work. Hi guys, today we're going to be reading our fifth short story from Leaf Magic and five more stories. Today's story is titled, Simon's Magic Doctor. Dr. Stephen Beaver lived across the road from Simon. For a doctor, he was unusual. During the week, he drove a car like an ordinary doctor, but during the weekends, he rode off on a bicycle, eating an apple. One misty evening, Simon saw him riding his bicycle, singing at the top of his voice. Dr. Stephen Beaver had bushy black hair and a fierce black mustache. He had a lot of freckles. He isn't a real doctor. Simon's tall brother, Peter, chided. A real doctor would cure himself of freckles. I think he's a magic doctor, he said in a teasing sort of way. I think he does black magic, modern magic, the kind you do on a bicycle. One morning, Simon found some bottles, and he sold them to the grocer. With his money, he bought some chocolate. The first thing that happened was that Simon's tall brother, Peter, came by and took half the chocolate for himself. Big ones are all the same, thought Simon. Take, take, take. The next thing that happened was that Simon's mother made him share the chocolate he had left with his little sister, Kathy. Oh, Simon became very angry. Well, I see how life is, he grumbled to the cat. Big ones can take things, little ones can get things given to them. There is nothing for anyone in between. Middle ones have to get their own things somehow. He thought for a moment and said, I have decided from now on I'm going to be bad forever after. I'm going to lead a life of wickedness and magic. The cat yawned and walked away. Before he began on his wickedness and magic, Simon ate a little bit of chocolate, the little bit he had left. It's safe now, he thought. If a man sells bottles, he should eat his profit immediately. He looked up and down the street, trying to think of some great wickedness. <clears throat> He thought of quite a lot of wickedness. Some of them were too hard. Some were too dangerous. And he did not like the idea of the rest of them. Then Simon thought hard for a few moments about magic. When he thought of magic, he thought at once of Dr. Stephen Beaver. Simon went in at Dr. Stephen Beaver's gate. He saw his bicycle leaning against the garage. Simon knocked on Dr. Stephen Beaver's door. The top half of the door opened and Dr. Stephen Beaver looked out. He looked down at Simon with very blue eyes. What can I do for you, sir? He asked. Simon had never been called sir properly before. I want to learn some magic. He said, I want to learn it quickly. I need it at once. Dr. Stephen Beaver looked surprised. Why do you think I can help you? He asked. Because you are magic, doctor. Everybody knows it, said Simon. Oh, I'm just an ordinary doctor, really, said Dr. Stephen Beaver. 
It is my first year of being a doctor, so perhaps I need some practice. But I'm not a magic doctor. No, said Simon. Everybody knows you are a magic doctor. You have a pink gate. Pink is not an ordinary color. It's not doctorly. You ride on a bicycle, not a car. And once, when you were riding your bicycle, I heard you singing at the top of your voice. That isn't a doctorly way of behaving. You are a magic doctor. Everybody knows it. Dr. Stephen Beaver opened the bottom half of his door. He let Simon in. Come in, he said. You name my guilty secret. I'm in your power. Good said Simon. I want to know some spells. I want a spell to punish a big brother. I want to punish a little sister. I want to punish a mother too. Oh, you want to punish a lot of people, Dr. Stephen said very seriously. Well, a lot of people are very bossy with middle ones, said Simon. Middle ones? are being treated badly. If middle ones can learn some black magic, maybe they can get some more respect. Mm. Maybe they will be allowed to eat their own chocolate. Oh, I am working on a spell at the moment, said Dr. Stephen Beaver. Would you like to come to the kitchen and help me? I think you might be able to use this spell. Dr. Stephen Beaver was wearing a striped apron just as if he were a butcher and not a magic doctor. He was mixing butter and sugar in a large striped bowl with a wooden mixing spoon. You may beat the eggs, he said. They are fresh, which is a pity, but it is hard to find good magic stuff in the supermarkets, you know. Simon broke the eggs into a little bowl. Then Dr. Stephen Beaver gave him an egg beater off of the table, and Simon began to beat the eggs. A good magic doctor has to learn to beat eggs a long time until they are very fluffy and thick, Dr. Stephen Beaver said. Simon made the egg beater whiz around. He was still feeling angry, and this was a great help in beating eggs. As he beat, he felt his anger wearing out. Oh, that is very good, said Dr. Stephen Beaver. You will make a splendid magic doctor. You show great promise. Then Dr. Stephen Beaver began to measure. He measured flour. He measured salt. He measured baking powder. He measured spices. He measured some raisins and some lemon peel, too. Do you think these are good raisins, he asked. Will you test a few for me? Nothing spoils a good spell like the wrong sort of raisins. Simon stopped beating and ate a few raisins. Oh, they are good raisins, he said. Do you think the pill is good? They tasted the pill too. Are you sure this is a spell? asked Simon. It seems more like mm, something else. Beating eggs, measuring, testing. Ugh. Dr. Stephen Beaver made himself look taller and sterner. It's lesson one at which doctor college, he said in a serious voice. All the young magic doctors have to learn to beat and measure. Beat, 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 measure, measure, measure. He mixed all his mixture together. Then he began to put the mixture in spoonfuls on an oven tray. Simon helped him. They put the tray into a hot oven. I didn't know magic doctors cooked in ovens, said Simon. They cook in ovens all the time these days, said Dr. Stephen Beaver. Modern, you know. Then Dr. Stephen Beaver made some sandwiches. He poured out two tall glasses of soda. He put a scoop of ice cream in Simon's soda. Now we will have a quiet magic doctorly snack, he said. Just two magic doctors, ice cream sodas, and a plate of sandwiches. The kitchen began to smell nice. 
By the time the sandwiches were finished, the kitchen smelled of baking. Dr. Stephen Beaver found an oven mitt, opened the oven, and took out the spell. Simon looked at it. It isn't really a spell, is it? He asked. It looks like plain old ordinary raisin cookies. Hmm. No, it isn't a spell, said Dr. Stephen Beaver. And I'm not really a magic doctor. Simon sighed. I didn't think you were. Ugh, he said at last. But I thought you might be. I'll tell you what I am, though, said Dr. Beaver. I am a middle one. Yes, sir. I have two big sisters, dreadfully bossy, and a little brother, said Dr. Stephen Beaver. I have lived a very hard life. That is why I grew my fierce black moustache. <gasps> oh, I like your fierce black moustache, Simon said. No one else in my family has one, said Dr. Stephen Beaver. A middle one needs something that no one else in the family has. I cannot give you my fierce black moustache, but I will give you my spell for raisin cookies. I made it up myself. Even your mother won't have it. And Dr. Stephen Beaver wrote the spell out on colored note paper. He wrote in fine curling letters, twisted like serpents. He drew birds around the edges of the spell. I did at first, he said. We middle ones must have our secrets. You may come and help me cook again. When you know how to make the raisin cookies, you will be able to cook some at home and astonish your family. In the meantime, you must take half of these with you. Dr. Stephen Beaver walked to the gate with Simon. I like my pink gate, he said. I like to ride bicycle and eat apples. I like to sing at the top of my voice on a misty day. It cheers me up. I will come again soon, said Simon. Middle ones must stick together. And magic doctors must stick together too, said Dr. Stephen Beaver. We need not to be magic doctors, but we must keep trying. Then he waggled his fierce black mustache. Simon laughed. The street seemed different now that there was another middle one on it. The lost chocolate did not matter so much. It was gone forever, but the raisin cookies were here now. I think you might be a good magic doctor after all, <clears throat> said Simon to Dr. Stephen Beaver. The end. So that was our final leaf magic story. And today, uh, after our reading, is our quick little writing assignment. Let's get to it. All right, so we have just finished the fifth and final story from Leaf Magic and Five Other Stories. So next we'll be going to writing our third task. So follow along with me. All right. Today, we're going to be using our Story Burger graphic organizer to answer the following prompt. Why does Simon believe Dr. Stephen is a magic doctor? How and when are those beliefs, beliefs changed? I want you to be specific and cite at least three examples or evidence from the text. In order to do that, I want you to use this visual illustration. Okay? For example, you will need to start with the main idea or topic sentence. Now, if we review, let's think back. What is a topic or main idea? Okay, the main idea can be anything, um, but it is a specific opinion. It's basically what the story is mostly about. That is the main idea. And usually, 
in a writing. It'll be a specific opinion, point or view, point of view, or ex expressed idea. So we are looking for that specific point of view or idea that's being expressed, the main idea. Now, Simon believes Dr. Stephen is a magic doctor and that he can teach him spells. Does he believe that? Why does he believe that? Okay, so you're going to state the main idea of the story and you're going to follow it up with details from within the story that I read. So you'll provide detail one, two, and three. So think of it like this. The details are examples will follow the main idea. It's what's going sandwiched in between the top bun and the bottom bun, okay? It's the meat, it's the pickles, it's the lettuce, it's the condiments, the dressing, all those luscious examples, the evidence that confirm the main idea. So it starts with one idea. And then we are given a list of specific examples to either prove or disprove, is Dr. Stephen, in fact, a magic doctor? Hmm. Well, I want you to state your belief or opinion and then choose a minimum of three details from our story as to why is he a magic doctor? Well, why does Simon think so? What are three things that would tell us he is magical or not, okay? Then at the very end, we will come to the conclusion or wrap up. A wrap up ensures that all these pieces and things we have in here don't all fall out, okay? It keeps it bundled together, right? It wraps it and ties up everything that's inside and keeps it connected. Um, it was once explained to me this way. If you have three strands of, let's say, yarn or hair that you are braiding, you are weaving together a story. And let's say the ponytail holder keeps it in place. It wraps it and binds it, ties it all together so that it stays in place. Well, the same is true for a writing or any work of art. The conclusion wraps it up, ties it together so that it sticks, so that it's one solidified, cohesive unit. This is one burger. A braided hair would be one hairdo. Okay, so that conclusion is that final layer, the final bun, or maybe it's the hair tie, whichever analogy works for you. But the conclusion will wrap up what the whole story is about. It will often restate the main idea, right, why that is true, and it will make all of these pieces come together in one complete unit. Okay, so what I'd like for you to do is to go ahead and download the PDF that is up um, under the fourth and fifth grade tab in my classroom. You will find a worksheet. This worksheet is a story burger graphic organizer. I want you to go ahead and print that up and use that to answer this prompt. Okay, again, make sure to include the main idea, three details, and a conclusion. Thank you and enjoy. I can't wait to read your assignments. Awesome. So today for our grammar, we're going to have a review. This will allow you to get familiarized with the new Khan Academy system. Today, we'll be talking about nouns. Easy, right? You know all about this. What's a noun? Go ahead, tell me. That's right. A person, a place, or a thing. But it's also 
an idea. So, let's talk a little bit more about that. There are two different types of nouns. Well, more than that, but today we're going to focus on these two. There are concrete nouns and abstract nouns. So what is the difference between a concrete and an abstract noun? Well, a concrete is, like it says, concrete. It's physical. It's something you can see, touch, taste, smell, maybe hold it in your hand. It is a physical thing. Some examples of a concrete noun might be pie, or gym, bicycle, book, or even this school. A concrete noun can be literally anything. The floor I'm standing on, the ruler in my hand, the vest I'm wearing, or the marker or the board, the roof. Concrete nouns are all around us. They're in many, many sentences. It's easy to tell a person, a place, or a thing. What might not be as familiar is this category, abstract nouns. What is an abstract noun? Well, it's an idea. It's not something that's physical. It's intangible. You cannot hold it or necessarily see it or taste it or feel it. It might be an idea, a thought, or maybe even an emotion, something you feel inside or think with your mind. Some examples of abstract nouns might be, again, an idea, a reminder, maybe freedom, democracy, or even true love. Ooh, those could all be nouns. So let's take a look at that and see if we can think of some examples for abstract nouns. Let's see. I have a great idea. Oh, wait. Right there. I just used an abstract noun. I have a great idea. Well, do I have a great idea? It's not in my hands. I can't see it. Where's this great idea? Right here idea used in this context is actually a noun. It's the subject that we're talking about. I have a what? An idea. Idea is an abstract noun. What about reminder? Oh, my mother gave me a reminder to call Aunt Bertha on her birthday. She gave me a what? A reminder. Well, how did she give it to you? You know, I didn't see it. Oh, it was verbal. Maybe you heard it. But a reminder is an abstract noun. So maybe you can see it. Maybe you can't. Okay? Maybe it's just an idea. Um, what about the next one? Freedom. Now there's a lofty idea. Freedom. Let's see. Our founding fathers fought for our freedoms freedom of speech, right? That's what we're learning about in social studies. So freedom, they fought for what? They fought for freedom. Where's this freedom? They gave us freedom. We have freedoms because of our constitution. Hmm, our freedom is given to us. Well, we may not be able to see it or hear it or smell it or taste it, but it is, in fact, a noun. It's an abstract noun. What about democracy? This country was founded on the principles of democracy. Wow, that's an odd ingredient. Hmm. Now, I can see the wood. I can see the stuccoed walls, right? I can see the tiled roof. I cannot see this foundation of democracy, it's just an idea. It's something, ideas, that this country was built around. Why right? we have laws, we have different things governing it. Democracy is an idea. This country stands for democracy. What about true love? Hmm, he's sad. He lost his first true love. 
Hmm. He lost his true love? Well, where did it go? Look in your pockets. Where did you have it last? Where is this true love you speak of? Well, true love, love, where does it exist? Maybe in your heart. Maybe love is an emotion. You can't grab it. You can't see it. Maybe you can feel it. But you're talking about it. I can't feel your love. I don't see your love. I can't even feel it with my own heart. I'm just hearing you talk about this true love. What is this? It's just an idea. It's a thought. It's an emotion, right? It's an abstract noun. All right? So let's go ahead and write a couple sentences on the board. And I want you to determine where the abstract versus concrete nouns are. Come on. I know you can do this. Let's do it together. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and put this new concept into action. Okay? So we're going to identify both the concrete and abstract nouns in these sentences that I've written on the board. We will go ahead and underline concrete nouns in blue and abstract nouns in red. So remember, a concrete noun is something physical, something you can see, hear, taste, touch, maybe smell, okay? Whereas an abstract noun is intangible. You cannot touch it. It is not a physical thing. It may be an idea or an emotion, for example. So, let's get started. First sentence. She had a fear of spiders. Let's go ahead and find all of our nouns. Now, remember, there may be some other nouns. There are different types of nouns we won't be focusing on today, such as pronouns, for example. Let's just go ahead and find all concrete, basic nouns, and abstract nouns. Have you found it yet? Hmm. She had a fear of spiders. Well, spiders, you can see them, right? You can feel them. That's a concrete thing, a spider. It's a concrete noun. But fear, she had a what? She had a fear. Oh, well, you can't hold it. You can't see it. You can't taste it or touch it. It is an emotion. Fear. It is an abstract noun. So we have abstract and concrete. Two so far. And I'm not going to go ahead and underline that. We do know that she stands for the subject, which is also a noun, but it's a pronoun. So we'll get to that later. Let's go ahead and go to sentence number two. Dan will steer the boat. Dan will steer the boat. Well, Dan is a person, right? So that's pretty concrete, person, place, or thing. Boat is also a thing. It's physical. You can see it. You can feel it. You can even take a ride on it. So Dan and boat are both concrete nouns. Do you see? Any abstract nouns in that sentence? Nope, neither do I. So let's go ahead and go on to number three. Upon waking, I struggled to recall my dream. Upon waking, I struggled to recall my dream. So, I, another pronoun, struggled, that's action, to recall my what? dream. Hmm. Trying to recall, struggled to recall, recalling, uh, also a verb, right? The different parts of speech. So there's verbs, there's adverbs, there's adjectives. We're looking for a noun, either concrete or abstract. Dream. Hmm. They're referring to the subject of a dream, but I can't taste it, touch it, or see it, so it must be an abstract noun. OK? 
okay? Upon waking, I struggled to recall my dream. How you doing so far? Let's try the next one. The zoo will close temporarily. The zoo will close temporarily. So we're looking for a person, place, or thing. Well, a zoo is definitely a thing, right? Or a place, excuse me, you can go there. I will go to the zoo, where? To the zoo, it's a place, okay? It's a, it's a common noun, it's not capitalized. It didn't say Reed Park Zoo, right? Just zoo, go into the zoo, it's a place. And the zoo will close temporarily. Anything else? I don't think so. Check. Let's move on. And the final sentence. My mother gave me permission to have a play date with Jan. Wow, that's a big one. There might be more than one noun here. There's a clue. Go ahead and take another look at that. What can you find? My mother gave me permission to have a play date with Jan. So remember, you're looking for both concrete as well as any possible abstract noun. So a person, place, thing, or idea. Do you see anything like that? Well, that one's pretty easy. A person. My mother gave me permission to, wait, she gave me what? She gave me permission? Where, what is this permission? I don't see it. I can't touch it. She gave me something. It's an idea of something. It's what? It's permission. She gave me permission. So the subject is permission. That must be a abstract noun. My mother gave me permission to have a play date. To have a what? A play date. A person, place, or thing. Is a play date a thing? Well, kind of. You're getting the idea. A play date or an event is something, in fact. So that is, in fact, An abstract noun. Why? We can't feel it. We can't touch it. What is this? It's a play date. Yay! Having fun, aren't we guys? Why? Because it's a play date. It's just an idea. It's just a term that we're using. But you can't hold it. You can't taste it. You can't smell it. It's just an idea. So, but it is a thing. It's an event and it's an abstract uh, noun. So my mother gave me permission to have a play date with Jan. With Jan. Jan is, oops, I'm using, I almost used the wrong color, making mistakes. <laughs> uh, concrete, or a common, right? It's a, well, it's actually a proper noun, because it's a person, it's specific, but it's concrete. Why? Because it's a person, because we can see her. Right? She has a name. She can talk. We can hear her. Maybe smell her if we get close enough. So, I hope this helps. Concrete versus abstract nouns. I'm going to next have you go to Khan Academy where you're going to be learning more about these nouns and putting to practice what you've learned. I can't wait to see it. As always, do your best work. Thanks for joining me. Hello, today for math, we're going to be multiplying using an area model. So we have done many various forms of multiplication. We have used a standard or traditional method of multiplying over here. We've used lattice and today we're using an area model. So for most of my fourth and fifth graders, uh, this should be review for you, okay? Again, um, at the beginning of this Khan Academy online learning system, we wanted to 
go back and review some things with you so that way you can get introduced to the system with concepts you're already familiarized. But it's important to keep practicing as well as to learn some new and different techniques. So if you're joining us and you have not learned the area model method, that's what we'll be learning today. Great. So for our first problem, we have 35 multiplied by 12. So we're going to find the product or the answer to 35 multiplied by 12. Again, this is the traditional form of multiplication. All right. So what did I do here? I've multiplied 35 by 12. Starting with the 2 in the 1's place, I go 2 times 5 is 10. 0 goes here and carry the 1. 2 times 3 is 6 plus 1 is 7. Right? So we just did number 2. First we multiply this, then we multiply that. Next we move from the 1's to the 10's place. From our 1's or first row to our second row. So we go downstairs. We're going to put a 0 right for our placeholder and then we're going to move to the not the ones but the tens place because we're starting in the tens place for the second digit and we're going to go one times this and one times that right so one times five is five one times three is three we make sure to have nice easy to follow columns there right everything's nice and lined up then we add 0 plus 0 is still 0. 7 plus 5 is 12. 2 goes here and we carry the 1. 3 plus 1 is 420. So our answer to 35 times 12 is 420. I'm just going to go ahead and circle that. So that is our traditional or standard way of multiplying and now we're going to do it with our area model. So the first thing we need to do is to break it down. To do that we're going to use expanded form. So if you're one of my kiddos you should be very familiar with uh, expanded form. Expanded form, which is here and here, is simply this digit or number broken down, it's the value of the number broken down by place value, right? So 35 in expanded form is written from right to left, 30 plus 5. 30 for the tens place value and 5 for the ones place value. So we have 30 plus 5 multiplied by 10 plus 2. We have 10 for the 1 in the tens place and the 2 for the 2 in the ones place. So 1 10 unit and 2 individual units, right, in the ones place. So again, expanded form is simply the value of the number represented by place value. All right, so 30 plus 5 multiplied by 10 plus 2 is the same as 35 multiplied by 12. Then we come down here and we're going to create a box, just like we do with our lattice work, right? So we create a box and we go 30 by 5, got that, multiplied by 10 by 2, 10 by 2, okay? So, sometimes it helps if I put a little X here in the corner, right? So we're simply going to multiply now. 10 times 30 is 300. And what's our little trick? We have a mental math trick for that. 1 times 3 is 3 plus how many zeros? 1, 2. 1, 2. So 10 times 30 is 300. 
So first we do 10 times this, then we do 10 times that. So 10 times that is 50. Again, using our little mental math trick, 1 times 5 is 5, and add the zeros, 1. So 50. So we did this times this and this times that. Next, we're going to do this times this and then this times that. So 2 times 3 is 6, and 2 times 0 is 0. 4, 60. So we did 2 times this. Now we'll do 2 times that. 2 times 5 is 10. So now that we've got each number, we need to add it up just like we did over here. So we have 300, we have 50, we have 60, and we have 10. We go ahead, make sure our rows and columns are nice and lined up, right? And organized there, and then we go ahead and add. Zero plus zero, still zero. Five times six is 11, plus one is 12. Carry the one, three plus one is four. Our answer is still, 420. I'll go ahead and circle that. So we get the same answer no matter which method we use. We can use traditional multiplication and our answer or product is 420. We can use the area model method like this and our answer is still 420. Let's try it one more time. Okay. So over here, again, let's try it first using our traditional multiplication method, 54. 54 times 16. 6 times 4 is 24, right? Yep, carry the 2. 6 times 5 is 30 plus 2. 30 Two. All right. We went from the ones place to the tens place, right? So now we need to go from the first row to the second. We're going to put a zero there for our placeholder. That's for the ones. Now we're in the tens. Yep, in the tens. First times this, then times that. And we used that, so we'll put a slash through it. So first this, one times four is four. And then that, one times five is five. So now we add. 4 plus 0 is 4. 4 plus 2 is 6. And 5 plus 3 is 8. Our answer, 54 multiplied by 16, is 864. Right? Let's go ahead and circle that. All right, let's see if we get the same answer using our area model. First thing again we're going to do is write it in expanded form. So 54 is actually 50, we have 50 in the tens place and 4 in the ones place, times 16, we have 10 in the tens place, right? And we have 6 in the ones place, all right? So there's our expanded form. Easy enough. Let's keep going. Now we're going to form our box. Again, 50 plus 4, 50 plus 4, and then 10 plus 6, 10 plus 6, okay? All right. So, again, put a little X here, our little multiplication sign, all right? So we're going to go this times this, this times that. 1 times 5 is 5. Add our zeros, there's 2, so it's 500, right? 10 times 50 equals 500. This times this, this times that. 10 times 1 
is 4 plus how many zeros? 1. So 10 times 4 is 40. Okay, we did this times this and this times that. Now we're going to do this times this and this times that. 6 times 5 is 30. Plus how many zeros? One more. So 50 multiplied by 6 is 300. This times this, now this times that. 6 times 4 is 24. Now we're simply going to add it together. 500 plus 40 plus 300 plus 24. So, oh, <laughs> I was looking at the wrong answer. There I was like, oh no, we got the wrong answer. No, we're good. I think we're good so far. So far, so good. Zero plus four is four. Four plus two is six. And five plus three is eight. Oops, not sure if you can read that, but the answer is the same, 864. And let's go ahead and circle that. So again, the same answer. Two different ways or methods of multiplying, but the product or end result is still the same. All right. So now, I want you to go ahead and go to the Khan website, and you're going to go ahead and go through the tutorials and do your assignments. Have fun, and I can't wait to see your work. Bye, guys.